Good afternoon uh, to our colleagues uh, joining from Philippines and hello to uh, all the rest of the world uh, joining our second live event, the technical training uh, workshop focused on commercial uh, refrigeration advanced technologies. My name is Jan. Uh, I'm the head of the global partnership at the Cold Chain Innovation Hub. I'm here uh, pleased to uh, moderate uh, and host the event together with my colleagues, uh, Gilda, the project leader, and Devin, the communication lead. We will take you through the next uh, three hours. We have some fantastic content, and we hope it will be of much of a use for you. So in the beginning, allow me to uh, introduce briefly the agenda uh, for the next uh, three hours. We will start uh, with the welcome messages uh, from uh, the project partners, implementing agency and executive uh, bodies, DNR, uh, UNIDO, and Cold Chain Innovation Hub. Uh, this welcome uh, speeches will be followed by uh, Mr. Manuel Azuzena, uh, who will be talking about the training modules for commercial refrigeration in Philippines. The main uh, part of today's workshop will be focused on the uh, case study with R290 uh, Waterloo a system that was installed first of a kind in Philippines, in Manila, uh, just uh, early this year. We will focus on the, in uh, on the installation, training, service, and these aspects, and there'll be lots of hands-on experience uh, available to all delegates. After that, uh, we have a short 15 minutes break each of the sessions, technical sessions, will be followed by Q&A, so there will be a lot of uh, opportunity for you to ask questions to our presenters. After the uh, coffee break, uh, Binant uh, from South Africa, independent uh, consultant, will be uh, introducing the CO2 transcritical uh, solutions for a warm ambient. And we have a bit of a highlight uh, for today. We have a live streaming session from a training facility located in South Africa. So don't uh, miss our, uh, our, uh, our session focused on CO2 transcritical as well. Finally, uh, myself, I will give a short overview of the additional technologies and refrigeration systems that are being deployed by end use errors There's many other options. We want to make sure that these options are also uh, mentioned and highlighted in our technical workshop. And one of the upcoming workshops then can focus on, on other technologies as well. So uh, part of the, the program we have introduced last time as well, and you have received uh, the information in the newsletter, is uh, we will have a short Zoom informal meeting right after the webinar. So please join us. Uh, we can have an informal chat uh, with the presenters as well as the delegates uh, joining from around the world. So please don't uh, miss that follow-up uh, discussion as well. Briefly about the, the platform, uh, for those of you who have not joined us uh, last time for the live webinar, the platform, this is the console that you see uh, on your screen. You have a uh, possibility to click on different uh, logos and boxes. You can extend the size of the window. You can freely move around the windows as per your liking. You can also submit your questions that will be asked uh, to the delegates either during our event or uh, in a follow-up. You can see the speaker's bio. All the speakers uh, present today are, are listed. Uh, we can access their LinkedIn uh, profiles and so on. And finally, on the bottom uh, right corner, you can find the resources. Link to the uh, project website, uh, report, research report, as well as the Zoom link. So if you don't want to miss, the Zoom session, then you can already click on the link and open the window that will lead you to our Zoom uh, dialog. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, hand uh, the virtual floor to our colleague Gilda, the project leader, who will introduce uh, our uh, welcome uh, speakers and will also give the background uh, of the project that we are representing today. So thank you very much for tuning in today and enjoy the technical training workshop. Hello, good afternoon. Again, I'm Hilda Garibay, the project leader of the Food Cold Chain Project in the Philippines. So let us start today's activity by a welcome message to be given by our government partner, DNR, through Honorable Marshall Amaro Jr., Assistant Secretary for Policy, Planning, and Foreign Assistant and Special Project. <laughs>
Good day to everyone, and thank you for attending this online workshop on Advanced Technologies for Commercial Food Retail, hosted by the Cold Chain Innovation Hub and organized by the, our partners at Unido and Checo. We all need fresh and safe food, especially today. But a huge part of getting that food to our tables requires the use of cold chain technology. And currently, we have a large amount of food loss because of the inadequacy of our cold chain system. This affects the income of our farmers, the availability and cost of food to our people, and ultimately, it leaves a big impact on our country's overall food security. Furthermore, food cold chain technology has a big impact on the environment. Farm to fork refrigeration systems contribute significantly to climate change through the release of refrigerants into the atmosphere and indirectly through fossil fuel based energy use. We, the stakeholders, government agencies and policymakers, international development partners, technology suppliers and engineers, and those of you in the business of producing and distributing our food must cooperate today to achieve our common goals of food security, food safety, and environmental sustainability. We at the DNR have partnered with UNIDO for a long time in the implementation of the Montreal Protocol. Now with this global partnership for improving the food cold chain in the Philippines project, we are working on supporting the policy and safety regulations needed to implement the most efficient and environmentally sustainable food cold chain technology that exists in the world today. I am personally very excited to know that the project not only has the potential to help secure the food supply of our country's people today, but also lay the groundwork for building our country's food cold chain infrastructure of the future. It is already amazing to see the support and interest coming from those who have joined the Cold Chain Innovation Hub community so far, from the first webinar held last month to today's first technical training workshop and to the several upcoming events scheduled this year. Thank you again to everyone, and I'm looking forward to working with you all to drive this important initiative forward. Mabuhay. Thank you, Ama Asek Amaro, on the strong message on food losses, environmental impacts of food cold chain technology, policy and safety regulation, and working together to achieve food security, food safety, and environmental sustainability. Thank you, DNR, for your support. Another message will be given this time by UNIDOC Country Representative Ms. Tony Lynn Lim. Greetings to all from the UNIDO Country Office in the Philippines with wishes of your sustained good health and safety. I am delighted to be part of the opening program and to welcome you to the Technical Training Workshop on Advanced Technologies for Commercial Food Retail under the DNR UNIDO Project Global Partnership for Improving the Food Cold Chain in the Philippines, funded by the Global Environment Facility. Even for, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, you will immediately understand the importance of this initiative, especially in the context of this global crisis that we are all trying to prevail from. First of all, the chance of enterprises from successfully rebounding from this crisis is hinged on a strategy that must carry with it energy and resource efficiency. This is also related to the fact that we need to continue and even ramp up efforts towards climate change mitigation such as in this project's bid for transitioning to low global warming potential refrigerants. Second, food systems were the ones mostly affected, but the ones that should be prioritized for continuity of, of operations and towards people's survival and continued well-being. The food cold chain is an important infrastructure and service that would not only reduce wastage, but also improve food safety in these times when sanitation and hygiene are of primordial concern. Third, this pandemic has become both a disruptor and accelerator 
for the Global Sustainable Development Goals. It is therefore imperative to maximize the adoption of advanced technologies, such as those for commercial food retail that we will be discussing today, and this project's already offering this platform for the Philippines to take advantage of the technical cooperation at the global level through the Cold Chain Innovation Hub. Lastly, the food processing sector, accompanied by the support infrastructure and service brought about by the Cold Chain, provides high productivity jobs, especially for technicians and engineers that ensure the proper functioning of such systems and who could potentially provide transformative innovations. This initiative, therefore, is an integral part of UNIDO's country program in the Philippines. From the purview of safeguarding the environment, but also in our partnership with the private sector and other development organizations. It is also very much in line with UNIDO's COVID-19 response as UNIDO tackles issues on food safety and resilient food systems, MSME's greed recovery, business continuity and occupational safety in industries, among others. To close, allow me to extend our gratitude to our partners from the DNR, TESDA, Department of Energy, Department of Agriculture for their coordinative efforts and substantive contributions towards making this project more meaningful in spite of the challenges we are faced with. Thanks as well to our project executing partner, SHECO, for organizing this training. Last but not the least, my appreciation goes out to my colleagues from UNIDO headquarters in Vienna, Mr. Adnan Atwa, the project manager, and Ms. Francisca Menten for their dedication towards ensuring this project's continued implementation. I thus wish you a productive session today, and I look forward to our continued partnership going forward into this project and other activities of UNIDO in the Philippines. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Tony Lin. And now to give you a background of the project we are mentioning, I will give you a brief introduction to our project, Global Partnership for Improving the Food Cold Chain in the Philippines. The United Nations Industrial Development Organization is implementing a project in the Philippines called Global Partnership for Improving the Food Cold Chain in the Philippines. It is funded by the Global Environment Facility amounting to $2 million US dollars plus co-financing by other institutions amounting to around $25 million. The Department of Environment and Natural Resources or DNR is our government partner. While the executing partners are SHECO, Technical Education and Skills Development Authority or TESDA, and financial institutions. The goal of the project is to identify, develop, and stimulate the, de the development of low-carbon, energy-efficient refrigeration, innovation technologies, and business practices in the Philippines for use throughout the food cold chain whilst increasing food safety and security. Through the project, it is aiming to establish a global partnership within the public sector, private sector, and financial institutions for promotion of investment and support of best available energy efficient design technologies and practices transfer. The project will concentrate on the comprehensive transformation of the commercial, industrial, and transport refrigeration system. Overall, the proposed project was designed to address the following. One, the impact of refrigeration to the global warming through the emission of refrigerants and through energy consumption resulting to greenhouse gas emission. And two, food losses due to inadequate cold chain equipment. This is affecting both the farmers and consumers. Adequate, fresh, and safe food are critical to our country that is home to 100 million people. The project will achieve such objectives through the implementation of four substantive components. Component one is the policy and regulatory assessment on the use of low carbon and energy efficient technology within the food cold chain. This is under the responsibility of the DNR. Component two is the awareness and capacity building on the use of energy efficient 
climate friendly and safe alternatives in the food cold chain. This is under Sheko and Tesda through the Cold Chain Innovation Hub. Component three is the technology transfer and established partnership among key stakeholders, also under Sheko and Tesda, again through the Cold Chain Innovation Hub. The monitoring and evaluation will be done by UNIDO. The Cold Chain Innovation Hub is the official platform of the project. It will serve as the project's central ecosystem of technical resources, training, knowledge sharing, and stakeholder collaboration. It is expected that through the CCI Hub, new technologies made available in the country, partnership between key stakeholders established, and financial scheme to develop bankable investment projects put into practice. TESA has been selected as the national entity to host the CCI Hub at its central office located in Metro Manila. However, because of our present situation, the CCI Hub is concentrating on its virtual platform, but eventually the physical hub will be established. So please subscribe to CCI Hub website for knowledge sharing, knowledge sharing materials and updates on events. So again, thank you very much for listening to the brief of our project. And now let's go to the main part of our today's uh, event. So, our our topic for our our first topic for our technical training on advanced technologies for commercial food retail is commercial refrigeration installation and servicing training regulation. This is to be discussed by Mr. Manuel Azazena, the Director of Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Technician for Development of the Philippines or RACTAP. Please let us all welcome Mr. Manuel. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Hear me? Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. And uh, to start with my presentation, I would like also to thank uh, Mr. Yon for giving me the opportunity to share in this uh, technical forum. Uh, I was uh, given the task to present about the commercial refrigeration uh, on the Tesla side. Uh, as one of the industry partners of Tesla, the RACTAP or refrigeration air conditioning uh, technicians for development of the Philippines uh, would like to share some of our uh, activities or accomplishment in, in terms of commercial refrigeration in the Philippines. Uh, as mentioned, Tesla is one of the uh, industry, uh, one of the prime partners of, of this project. Uh, now, Tesla is the training arm or, or the government institution which is uh, dealing with the technical education and, and training uh, towards, towards this uh, project. So the question is, is, what is the direction of Tesla towards claimable refrigerant? But to give you an idea, TESDA was created, no? TESDA or Technical Education and Skills Development Authority was created by a law, the Republic Act 7796 or TESDA Act of 1994. So TESDA's main, no? main uh, mandate is to provide a relevant no? and efficient, accessible, high uh, quality, uh, training, technical education and training for uh, middle level skilled manpower, no? which is uh, in line with the Philippine development goals. Also, TESDA under the Republic Act uh, 7796 no? or uh, TESDA law, there is a section section in the, in the law which states that uh, uh, TESDA is also mandated to conduct competency and certification. First, uh, the authority, when I say authority is TESDA, the authority shall develop and implement a certification and accreditation system, wherein this uh, certification assessment system has been in place in TESDA for a long, long time ago. It's just being developed again, redeveloped and updated. Uh, also, it says here that private industry groups and uh, trade associations like our association in, in refrigeration and air conditioning, may be accredited to assist TESDA in the conduct of competency assessment. So we're not just doing the competency assessment, conduct of competency assessment, but we also develop 
the assessment instrument wherein it will be validated and once it's validated and it will be put in place uh it says the local government units uh is encouraged to promote the assessment and certification activities uh, which is set by the authority you know uh now if you're going to put up a workshop you have to ask for a business permit you have to secure a business permit from the local government and one of the requirements now uh, being asked by the local government is the certification from PESDA. That the technician or the one who will implement the servicing he should be certified by PESDA. And all the certificates relating to the national assessment, because this is a national assessment, the certification, shall be issued by authority through his PESDA Director General or PESDA Secretariat, which is uh, uh, represented by Director General. At uh, present, it's uh, Secretary Sid La Peña. Now, uh, training regulations, this is one of the important documents. Uh, uh, if you are dealing with, with uh, training, assessment, and certification. At present, we have developed around five uh, training regulations. Uh, that this this uh, one in the screen is like the training regulation for domestic refrigeration or dome rack. The other one is a commercial uh, air conditioning installation. Uh, and the other one is commercial refrigeration installation and servicing. Uh, if you will note, uh, what is the readiness of TESDA in terms of flammable refrigerants here? In domestic refrigeration, we are now dealing with R600 a While in commercial air conditioning, uh, in the train regulation, we are now dealing with R32 uh, and R290. And in the commercial refrigeration, we will be dealing with R290, 404A, and 134A. So we are not just promoting one, one type of refrigerant, but other available refrigerants. Now, what, what is this training regulation? So training regulation is a very important document. It has four sections. Just to explain a bit about training regulations. It has four sections. Section one of the training regulation is the description of the uh, of the qualification for the qualification of commercial refrigeration uh, air conditioner refrigeration it says here, here that the commercial refrigeration deals with installation servicing of commercial equipment uh, ranging from 3TR or tons of refrigeration and below so that's the description now what is this uh, section 2 Section 2 is a package of competencies. In the commercial refrigeration, there are three main uh, competencies, the basic, the common, and the core competencies. If you want to be certified or if you want to, to finish a course of commercial refrigeration, you have to possess all of these competencies. But the main competencies here are the core competencies. So it also says here that after you completed all the competencies here, you can be a commercial refrigeration mechanic or commercial refrigeration technician. Another section is the training standards. Okay, what is this training standards? All of the contents here, the take off point is the competency standards. So all, almost all things written here are anchored to the competency standards. For example, the curriculum design. A school or a training center, if they will design a curriculum, a curriculum for their training centers, it should be anchored with the competency standards. So it also consists of uh, training delivery, uh, qualification of, uh, of trainers, uh, entry requirements for the uh, students or uh, trainees, and also the facilities, so, and also the institutional assessment approach. So take note, institutional uh, assessment approach, okay? And the other one is the assessment and certification arrangement, okay? So section four discusses about the national assessment and certification. In the previous, uh, uh, the, the, in the previous section, it says institutional assessment. So if you, you undergo an institutional, institutional assessment doesn't mean that you are already a national certified uh, student or technician. So 
So you have to undergo national assessment. So national assessment can be uh, taken by those graduates of formal courses or informal courses, short courses, or also those uh, working experienced uh, workers who has not undergone any formal training. As long as they can, they can fulfill all the requirements in the stated in the uh, competencies, then they can be issued a national certification by TESDA. Okay, now, as the readiness in, in terms of flammable refrigerant in commercial refrigeration. Okay, this uh, document here is a national assessment, a draft of the National Assessment Assessor's Guide. So it was updated last October 2019 uh, up to present because uh, train regulation is, uh, is somewhat like being updated every five years. But if there's a need for uh, a, an update because of the fast changing you know, in, uh, in technology, so the PESDA and the, and the industry can, can uh, uh, convene again to update the training regulation. Okay, the content of uh, assessment instrument, if you will look at this one, so, there are two ways of gathering evidence, the written test and the other one is demonstration and questioning. So the candidate or the assessee, the candidate should fulfill all these, uh, all these uh, competencies or uh, elements here for you to be a uh, candidate for a national certification. Now for the flammable refrigerants, if you will like this one, we have a a uh, we have an activity here which says recover and recycle refrigerant. This one is for the HFC, like 134A, 404A. But if you will be dealing with flammable refrigerants, for example, the R290, it says here the activity should be bent flammable refrigerants in a safe manner. So it will be observed by the assessor on how he will bend uh, flammable refrigerant like R290 in a safe manner. So everything, even the documentation, even uh, uh, troubleshooting is also included here. Okay. This is an example of the, of the activity that a candidate will be performing. And this one is an instruction to the assessor and this one is an instruction for the candidate. So if you will be taking commercial or if you will be assessed in commercial refrigeration, you have to perform all of this. So you will perform pipings, you will do unrolling, clearing, brazing, leak testing. So you will also perform recovery of refrigerants, uh, leak testing, evacuation, charging. If you're dealing with HFC, you will perform recovery, leak testing, vacuuming, charging. But if you will be dealing with hydrocarbon, you will bend refrigerant safely, then you will evacuate, you will leak test, you will charge. And then after that, you will record the parameters. After performing all of this, the assessor will recommend you for either a, an issuance of national certification or not. If you look, there is a competent here and not yet competent. So we don't have pass or fail, we only say competent or not yet competent. If you're not yet competent in one of the activities here, then maybe you will repeat the assessment again and, and until you, feel, you fulfill all the required, you know, the requirements in the assessment instrument. And this one document is the CARS or competency assessment result summary. Once a candidate took the assessment certification, the result will be placed here, whatever the result is. If the result is competent, then the assessor will recommend to test them for you to be issued a national certificate. It's like this. This national certificate is, is a well-protected certificate. TESDA is using a security paper here, uh, just like the because the, because the paper is coming from central so the paper is somewhat like a paper used for producing money then all the competencies stated here in the certificate 
your picture is placed here, then you have the validity. You have the certification number and you have a seal. So it's well secured and there's a control number here. Now, I interviewed some of the companies in refrigeration and asked them what is the use of national certificate in their company. So during our interview, one of the companies says uh, that the national certificate is being used uh, by, the, by their employee as a, as a document for promotion. So if you wanted to be promoted to uh, another level, for example, if you're a helper and you want to be promoted to be a technician, then you have to uh, produce this national certificate. Other, other companies says that uh, it is being used as a basis for a uh, permanent position in, in, in the company. So if you would like to be permanent in the company, then you have to produce a national certificate. Okay. And uh, also, if you are, as I mentioned, if you are putting up a workshop, uh, one of the requirements by the Department of Trade Industry, even in the local government, is for you, for you to present a national certificate from TESDA. Okay? So there are so many uses of this uh, uh, national certificate. Now, if the technician or an employee will present a national certificate to the employer, and the employer would like to know if the, the certificate is uh, authentic, valid. No? So he can go to the website of TESDA uh, through uh, the ARWAC or Registered Registry of Workers Assess and Certify. So you will just type the name, the last name, and the certification number, and you can verify if the document is really authentic or not. Because nowadays, there are some uh, incidents that happen that uh, the national certificate of TESDA is being uh, uh, no? uh, produced by some scrupulous uh, group. No? Because uh, having a national certificate is really a prestige for a technician. Now, uh, some companies or even training centers, assessment centers, they say uh, that with this changing of technologies, it will be more. It will be very expensive. Why? Because training will become expensive because uh, the training center will produce new equipment. Because uh, you cannot use the old equipment with these new refrigerants, new tools, new tools. Uh, some of the tools cannot be used for uh, R290 or flammable refrigerants. New instruments that is being used for HFC and HCFC. You cannot use that with a hydrocarbon-based uh, system because uh, of the flammability issue. No. Uh, like the vacuum pump, you cannot use an ordinary vacuum pump if you will be dealing with R290. You should use an ATEX-compliant uh, uh, vacuum pump, uh, just like the vacuum pump that was given to test by the GI set during the uh, training on commercial air conditioning way, way back in 2018. Uh, there will be new approach, no? New approach in installation and in servicing. They said it will be very expensive because once a technician will go to a certain servicing, he must carry with him a fire extinguisher. No? He must carry with him a ventilator no? if the site is not properly ven ventilated. So new knowledge and skills, no? So all of this, it will become very, very expensive. They say it will be very hard. And, and I agree with them. No? Uh, the training will be very expensive. Proper training will be very expensive. But you have to invest. Why? Because if you think that proper training is very expensive, then you try ignorance, which is more expensive than training. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening. Hello, Manuel. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Hi, very Manuel. Much. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Um, this is Devin um, with the Cold Chain Innovation Hub uh, Communications Lead, and you know, I, I just wanted to say, you know, from a, from a global perspective, we we really see that training is uh, really one of the barriers and one of the challenges that 
like not only you know uh, developed countries but uh, countries around the world in order to uh, adopt this new infrastructure this new cold chain infrastructure training is is a barrier but we see now that there are steps being taken to develop the standards and the regulations in the philippines uh, one question that i wanted to ask uh, very quickly was you know we have a lot of stakeholders uh, joining us on the call today everyone from in manufacturing suppliers and uh, educational institutions and uh, international development agencies what what can um what can uh what can people do to help support um what's needed to to help people um get the the proper certification and uh and training for this new technology in the philippines okay thank you devin for your question Actually, the training regulation is already in place uh, in TESDA. So all training centers that will offer commercial refrigeration should follow the new training regulations. Because it has been validated, it has been uh, presented for a consultation meeting, and it was adopted by the TESDA board. So all training centers that will offer commercial refrigeration should be uh, anchored with the new, with the new uh, training regulations. And also... For the assessment, uh, yeah. I have to announce that by end of this October, the validation for the new assessment instruments for commercial refrigerations, which will deal with flammable refrigerants, will be held tentatively uh, by the end of this October. So there's a group working on the validation, but it's almost on the finishing stage. Okay, so it's, it's very soon, actually. It's, uh, it's October already, yeah. so we're looking forward to that. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, that's good to hear, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that that's uh, going to be helpful information. Um, Manuel, if you could uh, move one slide forward, uh, we can show everybody uh, your contact information uh, and your email okay. address. And um, you know, I'm sure if people have additional questions, they can reach out to you directly. Um, I want to say thank you again for taking the time to present to us today. I think that was very helpful uh, information. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, um, well, we want to uh, take some time now to uh, move forward uh, with our webinar. We have the team from Cold Front Technologies Asia uh, online now, um, Emilio, JP, uh, Fritz. Uh, good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, we can, can you hear us, Kevin? Yes, sir. Yes. Good, good afternoon, afternoon. David. We got you loud and clear. Um, thank you very much for uh, for joining us today. Um, Cold Front Technologies uh, Asia is a contractor, a local contractor in the Philippines that has uh, installed the first R290 water loop system um, very recently in uh, Subic Bay at a Royal Duty Free store. And uh, today they're going to be presenting us with uh, the case study of that. Everything from the, the installation process to the, to the background of the project to some key challenges and, and learnings that um, that they faced uh, during during the project. So, uh, Emilio, JP, and Fritz, thanks very much for taking the time, and uh, I want to hand it off to you now. Uh, so please go ahead. Okay. All right, Devin. Thank you very much for uh, inviting us to talk to you today, and thank you everyone uh, in the audience uh, for taking the time to listen. Um, as Devin mentioned, uh, my name is Emilio Gonzalez. Uh, com our company is called Cold Front Technologies Asia. We are a, both a commercial and industrial refrigeration and air conditioning company uh, here in the Philippines, installing both primarily in uh, commercial spaces such as supermarkets and uh, industrial spaces like large cold rooms and uh, warehouses. So, to allow me to introduce uh, the speakers for today, my, as I mentioned again, my name is Emilio Gibalzo, I'm the President and CEO of Cold Front Technologies Asia. To my right is JP Cabanas, who is our electrical engineer. He, is he was primarily um, instrumental for um, installing the R290 water system at Royal Duty Free. He was working with the customers to um, do the layout, electrical plan, mechanical plan to install these. And then online with us today is Fritz Cabanas, who's our floor. Uh, uh, sorry, Fritz Pagaduan, who is our uh, project manager, who was primarily um, responsible for the installation of the system. So today, uh, 
I'm going to talk a little bit about the store information, a little bit of background information for folks online, specifically for the people who may not have the, have the opportunity to come to the Philippines or familiar with the geography of the Philippines. Uh, I'll talk for about 15 minutes, and then I'll hand it off both to JP and to Fritz to talk more about the technical aspects of the installation. And then we'll leave. Uh, that will be about 45 minutes, and then we'll leave approximately about 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes at the end for a question that anyone might have. Okay. So um, before I go into the store information, something I forgot to mention at the very beginning is that this is the first R290 water loop installation in the Philippines. And to my knowledge, I believe it is still the only R290 water loop installation in the Philippines. Water loop itself we, is still relatively novel here. Uh, there's been to date, I believe, only six installations. We've been fortunate enough to be involved with five of those installations. Uh, but this is the first one we did, and uh, I believe the first one in the Philippines that actually involves R290. Uh, Royal Duty Free Store is a, uh, a tax-free or a PX store or a uh, duty-free store, I guess, the best way to put it. Uh, that's located in Subic Bay Freeport Zone, which is approximately 150 kilometers north of the capital of Manila. It's uh, in a freeport zone that used to be part of the U.S. base. To go on to the next stage, brief history of Subic Bay itself. Uh, it's been a naval base as, since the turn of the 20th century. I believe it was first uh, used as a naval base as part of the Spanish uh, colonization of the Philippines. It then turned into or was converted over to a U.S. naval base at the turn of the century, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, all the way up to World War II. Uh, during the war, uh, it was occupied by the Japanese for approximately three years. At the end of the war, 1945, all the way up to 1991, it was taken back by the uh, U.S. and uh, operated as a naval base. Uh, I believe it was the largest naval base outside of the United States for the, for the whole time it was in operation. In 1991, uh, during the eruption of Mount Pinatubo, uh, the U.S. transferred ownership of the base back to the Philippine government, which was which then converted that area to a freeport zone, which it is up to this day. In 1993, uh, Royal Duty Free took over the Duty Free or the PX store that was run by the U.S. government and made it into a Duty Free store. Uh, prior to Royal Duty Free's operation of the store, the only way you would get access to the store is if you knew somebody who was in the base that would be able to bring you in. I remember as a child myself, we were fortunate enough to know some people that we were able to get in to get some you know, if you wanted chocolates, that sort of thing. So even though it was only operated by Royal Duty Free since 93, um, the store itself has been in operation for about 40, 50 years. Uh, if we go on to the next page, we can look a little bit about the layout of the store, uh, the approximate size of the actual store itself, or store one of Royal Duty Free. They have a second store that's more modern, but this is the original store uh, of Royal Duty Free encompasses approximately 1,600 square meters. The refrigerated section itself uh, occupies approximately 780 square meters. There's also a cold storage facility in the back that encompasses about 620 square meters. That used to be part of the original uh, basis to store as well. Now, if we look at the old layout prior to the renovation of the store itself, uh, you can see it here, there are approximately 20 uh, cabinets or refrigerated cabinets, refrigerated and freezer cabinets that were part of um, the store, which encompassed the 780 square meters. After the renovation of the store itself, um, the way we did the renovation was all wall-mounted stores or all wall-mounted refrigerated units are part of the water, uh, water loop system. The island freezers in the middle are actually plug-in, but are also R290 systems. Uh, if you add up the number of units we have here, we actually have 16 units as opposed to the 20 that was the original setup of the store. But because the units are actually larger, the 
uh, storage facility of the refrigerator units actually has not changed. It's still approximately 780 square, me uh, square meters. Now, uh, next slide is, uh, I have to admit, not my slide. This slide is actually put together by Roy Pineda, who is the ADP of Royal Duty Free. Uh, he presented this last year, September 2019, at Atmosphere in Bangkok. Both he and I were uh, invited, uh, lucky enough to be invited by, by Jan and, and the team to go and present kind of a case study on the source. So at that point, we, we were uh, presenting kind of the plans of renovation. Now this is a follow-up in terms of our uh, technical installation process. The store itself is about 26 years old, as I mentioned. Uh, in a 50-year-old building that was housed, uh, that was operated by the U.S. government, the refrigerated units itself is approximately 11 to 50, or was approximately 11 to 15 years old. The cold storage facilities itself is 40 years old, uh, which was continuously run from from the time it was still U.S. based. The current the current uh, refrigeration system. Uh, is a big, or the, I'm sorry, not the current, but the previous at this point, the refrigeration system was basically plug-in systems. These things have frequent uh, breakdowns due to high pressure, uh, due to the heat, heat emitted by the plug-in systems. Uh, also, there was insufficient air conditioning to deal with the heat emitted by the systems. And there's also high maintenance costs due to the frequent breakdowns that these systems encountered at its store. One of, um, I guess, peculiarities here in the Philippines is we do have one of the highest energy costs in Southeast Asia, if not the world. As such, air conditioning systems in storage are typically closed at night, uh, which taxes these plugging systems even more, which causes uh, frequent breakdowns. So why did they decide, or why did Royal Duty Free decide to uh, update the store? Basically, they wanted to find a solution uh, that would address the heat problem that they were encountering. Uh, they wanted to eliminate unnecessary expenses for the maintenance and breakdown that uh, a new system would afford. Uh, one of the unique properties of um, the water loop system is that the flexibility that it allowed uh, in order to do a layout that they wanted and as well as afford them the opportunity to change the layout or, or increase the size if they wanted to do further renovations in the future. A big requirement of the store itself is that they, this is an operational store. As, as I said, it was the flagship store, it is the flagship store, and it was imperative for them that they did not, uh, that, that they had zero downtime or very minimal downtime. Uh, with the system that we had in water with R290, we were able to provide them a solution for that that Fritz and uh, JP will talk to you a little bit more in, in, in a bit. Finally, they wanted to support green solutions. Royal Duty Free is part of a larger conglomerate, uh, Houston stores in the Philippines, which is really known as one of the premium stores here. As part of that image, they also want to be part of not only cutting edge, but also known as being environmentally friendly and as helpful to to the, the community environment as possible. So this is, was and is very important to them. Um, also, the, the G, G, demographics of the store is changing. Um, as opposed to the original people or people who are coming in 1993, now their children, millennials, are coming in. As they look and see, for millennials, uh, environmental friendliness is very important. So they wanted to make sure they address the concerns of uh, this new customer base. Finally, they wanted to support their new green initiatives uh, of both their store and their, their, and their parent company. If you look now at the next page, uh, here you can kind of see the, the benefits of, of a, plug, a water loop system as opposed to that of a plug-in system, as there is no heat emitted into the store. Because of the high energy cost, this translates to approximately savings of about $25,000 a year in less cooling needed for the store due to uh, uh, yeah. the reduced amount of heat that is eliminated. Or that is eliminated. And then finally, these R290 water loop systems are not only very efficient, they are also uh, have inverter systems in them for both the dry cooler, the pumps, as well as the plug-in HD R290 systems. 
because of the efficient nature of these systems, this is a slide that was also uh, presented in atmosphere. These are calculated numbers, unfortunately. We still, we're still collecting the actual numbers, but we calculated a savings of approximately 43% energy savings compared to uh, their plug-in systems and approximately 37% energy savings compared to uh, comparable remote systems. Though these savings seem quite high, we actually have real-world data from other installations outside the country that show R290 plug-in systems savings of approximately 40 to 50 percent. So we feel these numbers are very achievable, and we look forward to showing some of these new numbers uh, or some of these numbers to you, you real-world numbers uh, in a future discussion. Uh, with that, I'd like now to uh, turn it over to JP and to Fritz to discuss the technical aspects of our uh, installation. Uh, good day, everyone. So I'm JP Cabanas, the project engineer and design and estimate engineer for the Waterloop R290 showcase installation in Royal Duty 3 uh, in Subi. So uh, first part of the installation process is the preparation of piping materials and tools. Uh, we can see here the primary materials and tools needed for the Waterloop and R290 showcase installation. In this project, we integrate the R290 cabinets with the water loop system. As uh, you can see, the gate valve, brush connectors, stainless steel reducers, flexible hose, three or four stainless steel pipes, and the crimping tools uh, for stainless and copper crimping of fittings. Uh, usually, we ordered the stainless steel and accessories from abroad. Uh, that's why we need to purchase, purchase as soon as the project installation was approved. As per our standard, we use stainless steel rather than PPR or polypropylene random copolymer pipes for our water loop installation. This is due to uh, stainless steel is more durable and presentable. Uh, next is the list of equipment. So first, uh, one set three pans outdoor dry cooler. Uh, one of the major parts of the water loop system is the dry cooler, which serves as a heat rejection uh, equipment. It blows away the heat circulating inside the stainless pipes. Uh, we use an 80 kilowatt capacity uh, Gantner dry cooler for this project. Uh, taking into consideration uh, for calculating the capacity, uh, it's the ambient temperature of 38 degrees Celsius and relative humidity of about 18%. So another major equipment is a set of twin pump. A pump station with two units of pump, primarily, primarily set to have a continuity of um, operation if one of the pump had a problem. So we use uh, a set of 1.3 kilowatt each Grand Post brand pump uh, for this project. Then eight units of R290 upright chiller, which will carry products like beverage, dairy, and produce. Uh, the cabinets we use came from Prior, a uh, European showcase brand. So one unit of R290 glass door freezer, which will carry frozen seafood products. Also, a uh, pure show is brand. Then, seven units of R290 serve over chiller, uh, which will carry knee, poultry, and then products. Also, a uh, pure show is brand. Oh, and just for the, uh, for the tab, and, and sorry, we didn't catch this earlier. Besides, these are the list of equipment for the water system. Besides this, we also have 25 HT plug in R290 uh, island freezers that were connected. So, the piping layout. So, before the project starts, uh, we are required to have an approved construction plan for the installation. Uh, we need to have an actual site inspection first uh, prior to making of plans in, since it is already an operational supermarket. So one of the major plans is the piping layout uh, of the water loop system. As you can see, the red lines are the actual pipe run 
from the pump and dry cool station uh, to the R290 showcase. So another construction plan is for the revision of electrical system. Uh, since the old units are plug in type and the outlets are still very years in use, we propose a new electrical panel board for the equipment of R290 showcase. Uh, for the purpose of safety and longevity of uh, operation. So the red lines are the rigid electrical pipes uh, we use from electrical room uh, to the R290 showcase and equipment. Then, so installation of hangers and stainless pipes. So the first part of the installation, or, or we call it the zone one during the planning period is the installation of hangers and brackets uh, for the water loop pipes. Also included is the installation of electrical pipes and toolbox. Uh, the installation for this work are, are only available during nighttime since most hangers and brackets are in the selling area of the store. Uh, once the hangers are fixed into position, we then install the stainless pipes with the bulbs secure the pipes in the hangers, and print all the fittings. Then install water loop piping. So we can see in the picture the secured pipe run of the water loop system inside a Royal Duty Free store. So for the installation of pump and brake cooler, I will turn over to Fritz, our project manager. Hello everyone, uh, this is Fritz Bernardino Pagaduan, uh, project manager of Coldfront Technologies Asia and uh, the project manager for this uh, installation in Ro Subic, uh, Royal Duty Free Subic. Uh, installation of pump and dry cooler. This is zone one of our proposed project planning. Uh, we'll make sure that the installation is done before we proceed to dismantling the old refrigeration cabinets and replace it with R290 water loop system. Installation of platform would be conducted. Uh, positioning of pump station and dry cooling and piping is done uh, using our crimping tools and stainless fittings for fast installation. We use stainless pipes because it is highly recommended by our manufacturer, which is Freer, the brand of our uh, equipment and it is durable for corrosion. Furthermore, the installation of the pump station and the dry cooler must be 100% functional before the system and, and the system must be equipped for any installation to prevent high pressure on each cabinets. A plug and play installation, of course. The dry cooler is designed to operate to uh, 0 to 80 hertz for the summer seasons. And it is fully engineered based, de based the design and using a variable frequency drive or VFDs. Correspondingly, due to the result of our four previous uh, water loop projects, we decided to focus on control over the dry cooler operations. The main reason is that the Subic Bay is near by ocean range with a high humidity. And also this will achieve the manufacturer's uh, required water, water temp entering temperature, which is about 25 to 28 degrees Celsius on a liquid cold condensers. Air pressure testing of stainless pipes and connections. Uh, by doing this procedure, we'll make sure that there, is, there will be no leaks in the systems. We will be using the oxygen-free dry nitrogen to double check all piping connection for possible leakage. And the next one is charging of water and glycol. Uh, this procedure is a 50-50% per, uh, ratio of mineral water and uh, glycol in the systems. Water turns into steam at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, 
mixing with ethylene glycol antifreeze with water in a 50-50 ratio, increase the boiling point to 223 degrees Fahrenheit. We're using a food-grade glycol with anti-corrosion effects on coppers, stainless steels, and other metals. We use the external pump to charge in the mixture of mineral water and glycol in our system and we install also uh, air purging systems to remove air bubbles in the system. And the next procedure is testing and commissioning of pumps and dry cooler. As you can see in the picture, uh, on the left side, this is a ground focus magma twin, twin pump which is programmed to auto-adapt settings for cut-in and cut-out operations, depending on the needed load demand with a 12-hour rest intervals on each pump motor. This is a fully inverter pump motor with a variable speed controllers. In the right side of the pictures, you can see the VFDs in the dry cooler this is also programmed to run about 0 to 80 hertz with a liquid temperature controller with uh, automatic and man manual functions in case the VFD failed to run. Uh, another procedure in our installation processes, installation of R290 compressors on water loop uh, showcases. Since the project flows a strict time frame, we need to ship the R290 refrigerant cabinets beforehand to be able to set an, uh, everything on schedule. And we decided to install the compressor with the authority of Freer, uh, the manu uh, brand manufacturer. And also we requested a 60 Hertz compressor due to electrical issue. The cabinets have three compressors. Actually, if you can see the cabinets, you can see uh, three compressors with three separate circuits, uh, especially on a larger capacity like upright chillers and glass door freezers. In self-over equipment, uh, the compressor is only one, uh, the same as R290 compressors. Uh, the controller we use in these systems uh, is Karel MPX Pro controller with three electronic valve regulator and it works as a capacity regulator system for more energy efficient system. So, Prince, uh, I, I want to just add here um, one of the questions we frequently get when and I thought I'd try to answer that now before we move on to the next slide is how did we know how to do uh, changing of compressors and our loading of R290 into the systems as these are fairly new. So later on in the presentation, we do have a few slides where we share uh, where we did get an opportunity to go to Japan in assistance to NNS for the supermarket trade show, where because of our experience with water, we, we were invited by them to go and assist in their installation. Um, with, along with Freer, who was there in their uh, head of te uh, technical design, uh, while we were there, we did get the opportunity to train a little bit with R290 and, and install these systems first at their um, factory and then on the trade show floor itself. So together with NNS, we were able to work with them, to learn and train with uh, Freeor, as well as training that we received from AHT on the island R290 freezers. Thank you so much, sir. Uh... After we installed the compressor with a full authority from Freer, uh, we make sure that the system runs smooth, smoothly and in good running condition. So we test them beforehand. This is a mandatory procedure done in our warehouse before we deliver it on site. So another procedure is uh, changing, uh, charging of R290 refrigerant. As you can see in the pictures, uh, we have uh, three pictures, that one, uh, tools, uh, R290 cylinder, and uh, a glass of water as a comparison. Uh, before charging the R290 refrigerant on the system, uh, we use uh, two steps. Uh, number one is uh, preparation of basic tools and material, materials needed for installation. 
such as oxygen free dry nitrogen micron gauge pins of tools uh, shot of bulbs refrigerant hose and gauge uh, weighing scale and especially uh, combustible gas leak detectors, and most of all is uh, vacuum pumps. Uh, the second part is uh, the protocol of the mandatory use of personal protective equipment, or PPEs, is a must. The operating pressure follows a standard. Uh, 15 to 25 PSI, uh, low pressure side, depending on the ambient temperature. Uh, especially in the Philippines, we are on uh, tropical side, uh, tropical countries. And the high pressure side of the system is 220 to 240 PSI, which is almost the same with the refrigerant R22, if you are familiar with the refrigerant. Again, um, 150 grams maximum charge per system is required uh, based of our manufacturer's guidelines. And you can see also on the pictures of R290, uh, five kilogram tanks uh, cylinder. Uh, you can see also a half glass of water. Uh, just a li uh, just a little comparison. What is uh, 150 grams uh, looks like in the system? And uh, the next uh, pro installation process is uh, proper handling of refrigerant. Uh, this one, the first is to ensure good ventilation of floor level. Number two, uh, use only grounded apparatus. Number three, uh, take measures against electrostatic charge. Number four, keep uh, safety shoes, anti-static and non-combustible clothes, protective gloves and eye goggles are to be provided for every person's concerned with maintenance, repair, and recovery. Do not add anything on the refrigeration system except flushing agent, uh, oxygen dry, oxygen free dry nitrogen, uh, ref R uh, refrigerant R290, and uh, refrigeration oil. And the next part will be turnover for uh, Sir JP for the continuation of our installation process. The dismantling of existing old units and clearing of areas. So the project was divided into zoning periods. Uh, since the store is operational and Royal won't approve a prolonged shutdown that may took days. So first part of every zoning is the dismantling of existing plug-in units and clearing of the same areas where the R290 showcase will be positioned. Uh, the process of dismantling must be done quickly after the store closing in the evening. So uh, let me just add to that a little bit, uh, just to give a little uh, cover to kind of the challenges these guys had during this installation. One of the benefits or I guess the flexibility of the R290 water loop system is being able to install it to existing stores. Though that is possible, it, it's no by no means easy. As a matter of fact, it'd probably be much easier for us to install a brand new store than it is to do an existing store due to the limited hours that we're able to operate. So to, to give you an example, for this installation itself, the store is open to about 9, 8 to 9 o'clock at night, at which time the store inventory clerks would come in, unload the units, and by the time they were done unloading and packing the inventory back into the storage room, approximately about 11, 11 p.m. Uh, when they would turn over the units to us, at which point our team would then uh, proceed to dismantle the units, move them out, uh, clean the area, install the new units, um, uh, uh, get them leveled, as you'll see in a little bit, as well as um, plug into the water system. This all had to be done approximately 7 hours, so 11 p.m. By 7 a.m., they basically had to be done so that the store clerks could then come back, start restocking the units, uh, and have the unit in the, in the, the cabinets itself at temperature by the time the store opened around uh, 9, 9.30 in the morning. Um, 
I, I would like to say, I would like to say, I wish I could say that we were 100% successful, but this is the first store we did that. I would say our success rate was close to 85, 90%, which we're still quite proud and excited about. However, there were some cabinets, uh, particularly the serve over cabinets, where it, it did take us a little bit longer due to the difficulty of, of dismantling and installing the new units. However, the downtime was quite minimal where Perhaps it was just a day or so. So altogether, I think we, we were uh, quite pleased with with uh, the turnaround. So what did you mean about what are you do? R two ninety showcase. So the unit must be already at site during the schedule of the positioning of showcase uh, because of the limited time frame. Every zoning period uh, uh, will include. Three to four R290 showcase and must only do one whole night uh, to be uh, installed and to be Next, yeah, alignment and connection of common ends. So, alignment is important and need to be done right after the positioning of units, since it will be difficult to realign the units when it is already operational. So normally we use uh, laser tools to proper align the showcase. So as you see in the picture, the one with the tripod. So also we need to join the previous showcase installer. Then the installation of drain line. So usually the drains for a particular showcase is floor mounted. But in this project, the drains uh, are exposed or surface mounted at the back of every R290 showcase. A minimal civil and planning work are done for this project. Then the patterning of water loop connections. Once the R290 showcase uh, was uh, fixed into position, we didn't connect both the in and the out connections of a heavy duty flexible hole uh, from the pipe gate valve into the heat exchanger of the showcase. So the main pipe had already with the circulating water and glycol mixture, and these connections uh, must be properly tightened uh, using the uh, tapes. Then connection of power supply. So after all mechanical installations, the last part is the electrical connections. Uh, we installed uh, standard plugs, new set, new set of wirings, and panel boards with ratings and sizes uh, that complied with the latest uh, Philippine electrical code. Also, right after the electrical works are done, we're the testing and commissioning of the R2 Mentee Show. <coughs> So the produce and dairy showcase before and after pictures. So the old setup is in the left, and the new installed R290 is in the right. So heat and dairy curve over before and after pictures. The old showcase in the left, and the new R290 showcase also is, uh, is in the right. The beverage filler before and after pictures. The original showcase is in the left, and the new R290 showcase is in the right. So last one, the meat and poultry chiller before and after pictures. So the old units are in the left, and the new R290 showcase is in the right. So temperature and operations monitoring. So before the morning opening of the store, uh, we need to set the R290 showcase into the respective temperature range. As per experience, the average time needed for the showcase to reach the design pen using the R290 system took only one to two hours. Whereas the uh, R404 system may take uh, three to four hours. Since the showcase is loaded with products right after the testing, a monitoring personnel was on standby to check the overall operation and functionality of the system. Then, the positioning of 20 units uh, non-water loop 
R290 plug-in island cruisers. So this is only a plug-in type showcase, which is easy to set up and to choose a note. Then for the maintenance of R290 uh, refrigerant system, I will turn over again to Chris. Thank you, Sir JP. Uh, maintenance of R290 refrigerant system. The system uses a complete, completely hermetic compressor with a 150 grams of R290 refrigerant charge per system. No change oil needed for every preventive maintenance schedule or PMS, which makes it more cost efficient on the client's end. There will be monthly spring cleaning which is essential in every refrigeration cabinets and is required for sanitation purposes, regardless of the refrigerant use. Electrical retort is required to prevent loose connection that may cause fire. The system is R290, which is propane-based refrigerant and it's flammable. Flameless separation is recommended for the system using crimping tools and copper tube. We already buy a crimping tools intended for this repair for a previous uh, problem for this uh, future problem of these stores. So the, the clients are confident that the repair is uh, only using a crimping tools and no oxyacetylene uh, using in the repair of the R290 refrigerant system. The R290 refrigerant system and the conventional refrigerant system have similar maintenance standards. However, the preparation and maintenance of the R290 refrigerant system requires competitive knowledge of the system to successfully undergo procedures and prevent incidents that may lead to system failure of the equipment. Another maintenance uh, procedure that we done in our system is a uh, proper monitoring of glycol in the system, cleaning of wire strainers at the pump station must be done at least uh, once a year, quarterly cleaning of dry cooler fins. And then uh, for the next part, it's the rehabilitation of cold storage before and after installation. Uh, this will turn over to Sir JP for an explanation. Rehabilitation of cold storage uh, before and after installation features. So as part of our contract uh, for Royal Duty Free uh, was the rehabilitation of their cold storage. So uh, this is a conventional R404 system that was installed several years ago. We installed uh, new equipment and repaired most wall and ceiling panels uh, for each cold storage. So, uh, JP, I'd like to add a little bit to this as well, uh, just to perhaps answer some questions uh, pertaining to the cold room. As JP said, this was part of a re rehabilitation contract that we received from the customer. Uh, question, a lot of questions that may come up is why is this not on R290 water loop? Is there any technical uh, limitations on why that couldn't be done? The answer to that is no, actually. Um, it's very feasible to add water loop R290 cold rooms to and, and add this to the seating system. As a matter of fact, as part of our, the four other water loop systems we installed, the, the cold rooms itself were uh, connected to the water loop, although they, they used conventional 404 Freon and not R290. There have been other installations in Europe, uh, particularly by Freon that have uh, R290 and water loop. So th there were no limitations from a technical stand standpoint of why that had to be done. The main reason why we use a conventional Freon system for this is uh, several years prior to us being involved in the renovation, some of the back end equipment, compressors, compressor racks, were already changed out by Royal Duty Free. So they're relatively new. So in, in an effort to save money, they didn't want to completely re-renovate and, and change these systems that were still uh, operate fine and operating normally. So they asked that we change the panels that needed to be replaced, but use the conventional uh, R404 uh, rack system on the, on the whole rooms that needed to be changed and the ones that did not need to be changed, 
they asked us to just to re renovate and to, to do some PM work and get those systems uh, moving. The project uh, timeline. So this is the summary of the installation period it's done. So the installation time frame was agreed, uh, agreed upon by Coldfront Technologies Asia and Royal Duty Free prior to mobilization and installation. So we have given installation time from 10 p.m. up to 6 a.m. the next morning to every scheduled zoning period. So zoning one was the first part of the installation. So complete, completion of zone one includes the finished uh, pipe circuit, electrical wiring, and operational pump and the cooler, uh, which will last up to 160 hours of uh, installation, uh, installation. So the succeeding zone will be scheduled as per whole night of installation. So completion of zone two will include the operational beverage killers. The completion of zone two will include the operational uh, daily and produce killer. The completion of zone four will include the uh, operational meat and food reserve over uh, killer. Completion of zone five uh, will include the operational daily cheese and takes it over Chile. So the cold room rehabilitation zone A to D uh, was also installed uh, simultaneously with the water loop installation. But due to store adjustment, the smuggling process, and also civil works, uh, the total duration uh, of installation takes uh, longer. So 122 days of installation. So the 122 days of installation, I um, just want to highlight a little bit the flexibility of the water loop system due to the limited amount of civil works need to be done. It's much, uh, it's it's much quicker to install uh, and it's much more flexible system. But uh, as you can see, the whole loop took 122 days. By no means that was, uh, I, I would say that was all construction. There was also some limitations in time so when we can work due to. Uh, the requirement that these cold rooms also remain operational um, and also the amount of civil work that have to be done. One of the funny things about these cold rooms is that they were part of the U.S. base, so the amount of cement used on, say, the flooring of these cold rooms was, was meant for wartime uh, operations. So uh, double the thickness of what we normally used to and then just the amount of work folks had to work to do to, to be able to take out that cement slab was uh, quite daunting. But uh, uh, part of the limitations I said is uh, that they remain operational. So one of the things we had to do was actually went to reefer grants to move inventory into while re rehabilitation was being done to these uh, older units. Another challenge here was we were actually, by the time we were working with the cold rooms or the final stages of the uh, rework of the it was actually getting into November, which is the high selling season here in the Philippines. Uh, due to the holidays uh, coming up. If you go now to the next page, uh, you'll be able to see, so uh, we include here some finished pictures of the actual units, uh, water loop RT90 uh, units. On the left, we have a multi deck uh, refrigerator for fruits and vegetables. On the right is a serve over for seafood and meats. Next page, uh, we'll include the beverage chillers that were installed. And finally, the HDR290 of the Island Cruiser. Um, so that's basically the installation of uh, Royal Duty Free. Uh, we also wanted, uh, as I alluded to earlier, uh, we did get some training um, in other countries and were uh, fortunate enough to assist uh, one of our partners and one of the companies we were honored to help us Nihon Nihon Systems who came to the Philippines, saw some of our water installations, and when they were um, uh, putting up their installation for the Japan or Tokyo trade show for uh, supermarkets, they uh, invited us to join them in installing water systems. So Fritz is going to show you a little bit of the work that we did there in assistance to NNS. Uh, but also, besides us helping, we also got the training in terms of the R290. Because of the work and cooperation that we had with NNS, we were also um, invited back in order to help with the installation of the 
RT ninety systems in one of their preference So, Fritz, you wanna uh, thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, R290 installation outside of the Philippines. Uh, you can see on the pictures below uh, in, the, in the front of your screen. Uh, on the last uh, February 2019, uh, we traveled to Japan and assisted uh, the supermarket trade show exhibit of a local Japanese partner uh, company, Nihon Itsugen Systems. It was a challenging undertaking uh, to compete internationally with the Japanese marketplace but we were able to meet their expectations, even exceeded. They're very impressed with our craftsmanship for the installation and for the exhibit. And you can see on the pictures, uh, together with Sir JP and me, and the uh, representative uh, techni uh, head of the designing team of the Freer, uh, Mr. Gidi Minas. And the right side is the complete uh, engineering team of NNS. Uh, Nihon Nitsugen Systems. Uh, before that, uh, we landed seven days uh, ahead before the trade exhibit, which gave us an ample time to install all their equipment uh, on their factory in uh, Shiga Prefecture. Uh, we did testing, adjustments, and commissioning before the final installation at the Mukahari Messi. Uh, furthermore, for more uh, other information about the system, the Freer R290 hybrid water loop system is said to be suitable for countries with winter climate conditions. It's highly energy saving, uh, energy savings efficiency rather than the conventional rack system or a plug in system. Installation is more reliable. Uh, and efficient for a strict schedule time frame projects. So uh, you can see the self over uh, service case, the upright uh, glass door chillers and freezers. Uh, you can see also this uh, Gontner dry, uh, dry cooler with pump station inside. So built in and fixed. Uh, and then another slide. Uh, this is the installation, actual projects installation for a metro supermarket in Japan. So on uh, November 2019, I came back to Japan to assist again the Nihon Nitsugen Systems for the installation of AHT R290 plug in freezers. These freezers are the same with our Royal Duty Free installations. Uh, R290 systems. Uh, it includes also also uh, dismantling and positioning of new freezers, and they took us only four nights. Successfully handled the 65 units and complete the job while maintaining the quality, which is beneficial to the customers and the clients. So that's it. Uh, our, this is the supermarket and the finished uh, pictures of our installation for four nights. So uh, I would like also to thank, thank you on behalf of uh, Coldfront Technologies Asia Incorporated. I would like to thank our producers, uh, organizers, presenters, and attendees for giving me the opportunity to share my field of experience and expertise on the R290 water loop system especially in the Philippines. Uh, for future projects and partnership, uh, please feel free to contact us on Coldfront Technologies Asia, where innovation meets solution. Uh, once again, thank you and have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Fritz, and thanks, JP, for uh, presenting the technical aspects. I have to also extend my thank you to, to uh, Devin, to Jan, and everybody in the team for inviting us to present today. Also, we'd like to thank everybody online who came to listen in. Hopefully, we were able to give you a brief idea of the installation and some of the things we encountered during that installation. We'd like to thank Royal Beauty Free for allowing us to share this information with all of you, as well as thank NNS uh, for allowing us to assist them in their uh, installations in Japan and uh, learning as well from Prior on the R290 systems and for allowing us to help them with the installations of Metro. 
and also finally to Metro itself for allowing us to share pictures uh, with you in terms of the installations in Japan. So thank you very much. I think we're pretty much at the time limit. So Devin, uh, hand it back to you. And uh, we have a few minutes or 10 minutes or so, I think, for questions and answers. So we'll let you uh, leave that. Fantastic. Thank you very much uh, to the whole team called Front. Uh, fantastic presentation, great content. I think everyone will agree with me that sharing uh, such an intimate uh, information regarding installation is quite unique uh, from the point of view of contractor and supplier. So thank you very much. I think uh, many have learned a lot. We have uh, about 15 minutes uh, for questions, and there's a lot of questions being asked uh, during your session. So I will just uh, fire on please uh, feel free to decide who will be in best position to, to respond most of the questions are, are uh, of, of a technical character so far so i will start with the question um, regarding the um, okay i will read out the question we can also uh, push it to the uh, to the uh, audience so the question is in the event there is a gut leakage from the R290 system, does this store have alarm system? Uh, Fritz, do you want to answer that? Or? Yes, sir. Actually, uh, the, that's why we we explained that the charge is 150 grams. Uh, this is minimal uh, amount for the system. It only dipa uh, dissipate in the uh, atmosphere. So, uh, one cabinet is uh, composed of three major circuits, so three compressors divided. So, that's a minimal leak. And in terms of an alarm system, uh, the building also, uh, they have also an alarm system for the whole building for the uh, leakage of the refrigerant. Okay, thank you very much. Next question. Due to the location close to the sea, is corrosion a consideration in design? Is there any water treatment for the closed loop water cooling? Actually, sir, uh, the water loop uh, is designed as a closed loop. So the moisture, uh, the same, actually the principle is the same with the a cooling tower, but this is a closed loop. So no foreign debris, no foreign objects, and no other chemicals except, except uh, mineral water and glycol. That's why we are using uh, mineral water and um, glycol. Uh, we're not using uh, tap water because of the oxidation inside of the system. So uh, our pre based on our previous project uh, in 2017 up to now, uh, the first uh, water loop installation, we didn't add anything in the system. So we prevent the oxidation inside of the system because of the closed loop design. Uh, based on the history also of the uh, other contractors, our partners in uh, Malaysia, they encountered that problem because they're, use, they're not using glycol, they're using uh, tap water. So the oxidation, they replace the... Uh, what uh, liquid cold condensers because this is a brace plate design so that's the problem so i think from the corrosion that's why we're using a stainless uh stainless pipes and then we're using a 50 50 ratio of the uh, mixture of the liquid inside of the system thank you thank you very much let me add real quick a little bit to that so i ask uh, Fritz said, it, moisture is a big concern just all over the Philippines just because of the high humidity here. So as uh, Fritz mentioned, uh, we use aluminum piping, we use mineral water, glycol to uh, ensure no foreign uh, object or scaling happens inside. And then the dry coolers itself, these dry coolers are actually coated something like that. They're, they're called bluefin uh, coated. Basically, there's a uh, salt water proofing that's put onto the dry coolers themselves so that they don't, uh, they basically prevent corrosion of the dry coolers and allow them to last a bit longer. All right, thank you very much for the clarification. Uh, there was two more questions about the glycol and, but this was answered, I believe now. Next question, how is defrosting done? Okay, uh, 
actually the controller is a uh, uh, we program that one with RTC real time clock. So the defrosting of this system is uh, fully electric defrost. We're using a fully electric defrost, and it it's depend on the uh, products that we were program. Sometimes uh, eight hours, eight hours, uh, thirty minutes, depending on the actual uh, ice build up of our uh, evaporators. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll dive yeah, into the next question. What type of compressor do you use, and what is the voltage rating, please? Actually, the compressor that we use is uh, uh, Imbraco R290, and the voltage we're using is uh, 220 AC. Okay, 20, 220 volts. Single phase uh, AC. Single phase uh, AC, single phase AC okay. motor. Thank you very much. Uh, next question. For the leak testing of stainless steel pipes, what is the recommended pressure for the testing? Uh, actually, the water loop system runs only at 1.5 bar. So it's about uh, a times that one to 14.7 PSI. So it's around uh, 21, 21 degrees. At uh, 21 psi, so the leak testing we done before is nine uh, over 100 psi. But the system itself, we have a built-in uh, pressure reg regulated valves. So when we put that one in exceed amount of pressure, it explodes. That's why we only uh, maximum of five bars for the pressure testing of the uh, whole systems. So that's a manufacturer's guideline also. Uh, only five uh, bars maximum. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a couple more questions, uh, including from the Royal Duty Free Shops. Uh, the question yeah. is, do we need to replace the glycol and water? How often? Actually, based on our uh, uh, previous projects before, uh, we didn't replace glycol and water as long as uh, no contamination inside, no leaks, or even uh, only the maintenance for this system is the cleaning of the Y strainers. Because uh, you cannot flush that one 100%. So only uh, additional. Sometimes we add maybe around uh, two gallons for uh, purging of uh, air bubbles in the system. So thank you very uh, yeah, much. Oh, uh, yeah. So I wanted to add to that. So basically, since it's a closed loop system, there's no need to change. Only as Fritz mentioned, if there's any type of evaporation, we'll maybe have to top up the system. To give you an example or point of comparison, our oldest water loop system was 2017, and I don't think we've had to change or add uh, liquid to that system today. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. I, I take the liberty to also display uh, a message from Roy from uh, Royal Duty Free Shops. Hi, Emil. Uh, Roy from RDFS here. I just want to say thank you for the introducing to us the RT90 water loop system. Looking forward to working with your company in more projects in the future. So congratulations on, on a great feedback from the end user. Uh, next question, uh, rather than one. What peak condenser water temperature have you seen on site? Okay. Uh, uh, the highest temperature, uh, water temperature from the condenser, it's around 48 degrees Celsius. That's why we designed uh, VFDs of the dry cooler to make um, much uh, efficient the operation of our fan motors because the the what do you call this one the uh, water entering temperature design by freer itself is around 25 to 28 degrees so it's very hard for us dealing on summer times that's why we design a VFD with a automated uh, system using a smart controller with BID mode. So we can reach up to 0 to 80 hertz, but our design is we can work the condenser up to 120 hertz. 
uh, working on that uh, condition, especially on summertime. So maximum is only 48 for the uh, in in uh, uh, for the condenser uh, dry cooler. Actually, we're using uh, the dry cooler term in outside the condenser is the inside of the cabinet. So we're the highest peak of our uh, control, uh, dry cooler temperature is around 48 degrees only. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, next question. Uh, for your installation of R290, you mentioned you used crimping tools. What brand did you use? Uh, actually, sir, uh, the brand are used is International, uh, Jabrit, and Nova Press. So the, the uh, fittings also is came from the manufacturer. That's uh, that's why it's uh, very hard for us to find out in the Philippines. So the supplies is very uh, one of our learning experience here in the Philippines. Very challenging, actually. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, I'm sure there are many suppliers out there uh, receiving your, your your memo right now. Next, yes, next sir. up. Next up, what kind of leak testing has the manufacturer done of the R290 plugin before leaving the factory? Uh, would you would you would you comment on that, please? If if we don't know, it's fine. We can we can move on. This is a question to the manufacturer. Uh, yes, sir. Let me uh, comment a little. Um, uh, I was fortunate enough to get a chance to go to the Frio factory in Lithuania and, and see the, and, and uh, to see these units being uh, assembled, as well as to the AHC factory in Japan. In, I'm sorry, not Japan, in China, to to see how the island freezers are um, uh, installed. So one of the things they do is when they charge the R290 system, they actually uh, overcharge the system. I, I don't know what how much overcharge they put on the system. They put it in a closed room with alarms and they basically run the units and then see if there's any leakage that uh, occurs. And if they run it for a certain amount of time uh, in that closed environment and if no alarms uh, trigger, then they, they call that a pass and they then they move on to disconnect it and um, basically um, uh, have it ready for shipment. Thank you, Emil, uh, very much. Next question, we have a few more minutes. We will probably cut into the coffee break because I think also these questions are, are, are really good. Uh, next up, how do you control the temperature of every cabinet in and freezer rooms? Every cabinet and freezer rooms. Uh, actually, sir, we we put uh, the program, each cabinet, we, we program that one by RTC, so real-time clock. So the temperature, uh of that system is uh based on the client side the customers they produce us they give us the temperature requirement for every product so and also for the freezers all cabinets there uh so by means of uh, electronic controller that one sir thank you next what question are what are the Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. One of the benefits or one of the things we saw with uh, R290 is how much more efficient it is than the Freon systems. To give you an example, the freezers, the AHT Island freezers, typically uh, the, the Freon version of these free freezers uh, are typically at negative 21. Uh, the R290 systems, when we, uh, the coldest temperature, we can easily get it to negative 25, negative 27 uh, degrees. So much colder uh, in our experience we've seen much colder temperatures which uh, also contrib contributes to uh, food quality and food longevity excellent i i can just add to that uh, in terms of the efficiency you mentioned your experience with installation in japan and we have just mm -hmm. happened to uh, to interview the the end user in, in japan we have just published an article about their installation and the results uh, eight months of performance and they have achieved 40% uh, of energy savings with the R290 plug-in uh, cabinets. So this is this is a this is a great achievement. I think everyone would agree that 40% energy savings is a big deal. So this is another testament uh, to testament to your, to your work and to the to the potential of the technology. 
that in Japan is still uh, very much underdeveloped. And so this is this is the beginning, not only for Philippines but also also for Japan. I'm looking at the time. We have uh, we have reached our our time limit. So uh, Devin, do you have any, any 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 final question to ask to the team called Front before we move into the uh, coffee break? No, I just want to um, just make sure to uh, move the slide one more forward, uh, just to make sure that the uh, information for uh, contacting uh, the Cold Front uh, Technologies Asia team is, is on the screen for everybody to uh, make sure to get in touch. Um, and, you know, thank you guys for, for taking the time. It's it very, very, uh, very interesting. Maybe I can also repeat in this Thanks. point that the, the whole uh, the whole technical training workshop is recorded and will be shared uh, with uh, with all delegates and people that uh, did not manage to tune in uh, for the live event. So all this all this uh, well of, of knowledge will be will be available for the industry to tap into uh, when looking into the uh, RT19 and other installations. So also uh, from our end, on behalf of the Cold Chain Innovation Hub. Thank you very much uh, for, for joining uh, our event today. It was fantastic content, a lot of valuable information shared with the industry. So thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And with that, uh, we now move into a 15 minutes coffee break. So please uh, join us again at uh, in about 30 minutes actually from now at 4 p.m. Uh, Philippine time. Uh, looking forward to uh, continuing our uh, our event with uh, Wynand uh, joining us from South Africa, who will talk about CO2 transcritical solutions for warm ambient. So join us again in uh, 10, 15 minutes time, well, about 30 minutes time from now. Thank you. All right. Um, well, let me uh, push the next slide to the audience. Um, actually, we're, we're about a, a minute early. Uh, that's fine. Um, okay, well, uh, we'll just get started um, a little bit early, but I think uh, a lot of people might still have their computer screens uh, still on. Um, but yes, uh, my name is Devin. Again, just to introduce myself, I am the communications lead for the Cold Chain Innovation Hub uh, Philippines project. And right now I am uh, very excited to introduce Wynan Grenewald, who I've spoken to in the past. We've done a, a few training and uh, interview videos we, we have on our uh, YouTube channel. And uh, we're excited to speak with you today because you're going to tell us a little bit more about your area of expertise, which is uh, sustainable refrigeration technology, especially refrigeration systems that use uh, CO2 or R744 as a refrigerant, um, especially in high ambient temperature countries. And um, we also have uh, some uh, a little treat also we will uh, save until the, the end of your presentation. Um, but right now, I have the next slide up, and uh, whenever you're ready, Wynand, uh, you're good to go, and go ahead. Thank you, Devin. I appreciate it, and thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I think today I'll just try and share a little bit around CO2 as a refrigerant, um, technologies that can be found today with uh, advanced technologies, specifically around high ambient conditions. And then also just touch on some energy savings comparisons seen and done around the around the world when you're comparing CO2 with, for instance, R404A. Uh, so without further ado, I'll get into the presentation. Um, so basically, firstly, um, I would like to just touch on CO2 subcritical versus transcritical operation. Um, I have found that there sometimes is a confusion between the description of a plant being called a transcritical CO2 plant. Um, so the main differences between a subcritical and transcritical plant is just in the in the application or how it is operating. So, for instance, a transcritical plant can operate in a subcritical manner when the um, ambient is is low enough or cold enough that it will be below the transcritical point, which is 31 degrees Celsius. So the confusion sometimes is that a transcritical plant operates only in a transcritical manner. Um, but it actually is not so most of the areas. It's the ambient temperatures is fairly cold. And you would find that even a, a plant um, justified as called a transcritical plant will operate in a subcritical manner because of the ambient conditions of, of which it's seen. Um, so then basically also a lot of um, people ask me the questions around is it only negatives or is there benefits between having a plant operate in a transcritical manner? 
Um, so basically, there are benefits actually of running a plant in um, the transcritical manner. The, the first benefit of it is that basically there is no pressure temperature correlation. What this means is that you do not condense your refrigerant on the high side. Um, so you also do not have a phase change. Um, so what you will find rather is a continuous drop or rejection of temperature um, as, as it goes down according to, to the um, ambient conditions or the air conditions. Um, and that gives you the ability that you can have a closer approach when you're working in a transcritical mode. Um, so for instance, mostly you will find in a subcritical manner when you, con when you are condensing a refrigerant that you will allow for a temperature difference of about five to eight degrees Celsius between the refrigerant and the ambient air conditions. Uh, where with CO2 in a transcritical manner, this is about two degrees Celsius only because of the closer um, approach. So this means that you can still have a lower gas cooler outlet temperature, even at higher ambient conditions. Um, and sometimes the comparison that needs to be done when choosing a CO2 plant in the transcritical region um, needs to be taken into account that there is a closer approach. Um, additional benefits comes when you are utilizing this for heating purposes. Um, where you get a very good heat rejection method because of, of the, the, the capabilities and the properties of CO2 in its transcritical state. Then what is the main differences between a CO2 transcritical system? Because um, overall, a, CO, a basic CO2 transcritical system operates on the same parameters or same aspect as you would find a normal centralized Freon system with direct expansion. Um, so the main difference only comes in with the high pressure control and the low and the flash gas control. So your discharge pressure being at a higher pressure than what we will see in um, conventional refrigerants uh, needs to be released to a lower pressure where you will form, and especially when operating in the transcritical mode, um, you need to take your your gas that's in a um, in a or your refrigerants that's in a gas phase, you need to expand it into the two-phase area so that you can create liquid. Um, while creating liquid, you're also creating vapor. Um, and this means that you basically need to take care of that vapor and take it back to a compression cycle. Um, so this is where the, the two main control differences come in uh, between the high pressure and the flash gas control valve. Um, benefits of this is you can basically determine where you are running your discharge pressure um, because you do have a high pressure valve controlling your optimum pressure. Um, this is also critical when it comes to the operation of the system where the, depending on what your gas cooler outlet is, which is determined by the ambient conditions, um, your controller will determine what is the optimum place for your system to operate to have the most efficient um, operation. So then going into some technologies that can be found. Um, so basically your standard system that was the birth of CO2, if you want to call it that, is your basic straightforward transcritical booster system. Um, this system basically, like I said, has the high pressure valve and the flash gas valve that's additional to what would be seen in conventional, conventional refrigerants and therefore basically the rest of the system will operate in the same way. So this is a very simplistic way to have a CO2 system operate. Um, this type of system is suitable for subcritical applications, um, especially when it comes to efficiency of the system. So this system will be mostly seen in lower ambient conditions um, where you have predominantly colder areas and not very extremely high um, summer conditions, um, so Northern Europe, Northern Americas, um, there is a lot where you will see this system operate. Um, so studies have been done to show what the efficiency gains can be from the transcritical booster, which is taken as the benchmark, and then adding additional technologies to, to get more energy efficiency when you're running at a higher ambient conditions. So basically for the transcritical booster system, a lot of studies that has been found is that up to an ambient condition of about 27 degrees Celsius, you will find that the CO2 system um, <clears throat> is more efficient than a standard R404A system making use of 
um, also making use of variable speed drives, electronic expansion valves. Um, so basically that's why I say mostly subcritical um, operation for a transcritical booster system. Um, <clears throat> for this application here, I have looked at the ambient conditions of about 32 degrees Celsius to do energy efficiency comparisons, um, seeing that that is quite a average high temperature for the Philippine um, area. So basically looking at a 32 degrees Celsius ambient CO2 compared to 404A when it's working as a transcritical booster system um, is about 11, 10% less efficient than a 404A system. Then moving on to additional technologies. So basically one of the first steps in introducing efficient um, technologies to a booster system is the introduction of a parallel compression system. So basically the main function of the parallel compression system is instead of with the booster system having the flash gas that is created in the receiver vessel um, be reduced to, to the suction of the medium temperature um, compressors to be compressed from a lower pressure to the discharge pressure, this flash gas valve is now compressed by an additional compressor um, called the parallel compression set. And that compressor has then obviously working with a suction, suction pressure, which is equal to the receiver pressure. Um, so compression ratio within a system is directly related to uh, the energy efficiency of a system. So basically having a higher suction pressure and compressing the flash gas that's not doing any cooling work within the system to the same discharge pressure as the medium temp suction um, is what allows you for a higher energy efficiency. Um, of course, obviously operating in a transcritical mode, you can expect that after your high pressure valve, anything between up to 40 to 50% of the mass flow of the refrigerant going through your high pressure valve will be um, vapor at the end of the day, and 50 to 60% would be liquid that can be used for cooling purposes. Um, so looking at this, this technology has made CO2 more feasible and suitable for transcritical operation and therefore also is a more suitable solution for higher ambient conditions. Um, comparing again to R404A, it has been found that this type system makes you more efficient or gives you the capability of being efficient um, up to ambient conditions of 37 degrees Celsius which is quite a high temperature and does um, cater for predominantly most of the countries around the world. Um, looking at, a, at the set point of 32 degrees Celsius ambient, you will find that basically CO2 is, can be up to 7%. And depending on the technology and the installation and the setup, sometimes even higher, but on average about 7% energy efficiency gain on, uh, compared to a 404A system. Then looking at additional systems, um, most recently the introduction of ejector systems into a refrigeration system um, has been introduced. The main reasons for this is because of the pressure differentials found within a CO2 system, um, there is a lot of energy losses or energy available to do work, um, basically work that can be replaced um, or that work that can replace work that would have been done by a compressor. So basically your ejector system replaces, in the case of being used as a high pressure ejector, replaces your high pressure valve. Um, and what this does for you, a certain percentage or, an, or sometimes even the full amount of the medium temp suction coming back from your evaporators can be lifted by the pressure differential created by your ejector. Um, and instead of going to your medium temp compressors, goes into your receiver pressure from where it then gets compressed by the parallel compression group. So the saving that you have from compressing the flash gas at a higher pressure, you're now basically doing free work and lifting some of your or all of your medium temp suction vapor into the receiver to be compressed by a higher compression um, com um, pressure, um, suction pressure, sorry. Um, and then there's, but while still doing work at a lower pressure to, to obtain your efficiency. With the introduction of this technology, um, CO2 has been basically made to be energy efficient compared to um, any type of system and up to 
um, any ambient conditions. So this is definitely a suitable solution for extreme high ambient conditions and no additional um, allowances made for energy efficiency. Um, and at the ambient point of 32 degrees Celsius, 10% and more um, energy saving can be found for compared to an R404A or system. Um, as mentioned, these savings are depicted at ambient conditions of about 32 degrees Celsius. Um, so the energy efficiency um, increase is obviously higher um, when it's running at lower ambient conditions like it is with energy, any other system. But compared to its Freon counterparts or 404A in this stage, the lower the ambient conditions as well, the more the energy efficiency gain would be. Um, the showcasing here is just specifically aimed at high ambient conditions to show that technologies um, do exist that make these systems feasible and energy efficient and not just um, environmentally friendly and sustainable solutions. Um, there are a lot of additional technologies as well. Um, I mean, the installation side of your CO2 system leads to energy efficiency. Um, so this is literally just comparing the specific technologies that can be utilized. Additional to the above mentioned technologies, um, these systems can also be equipped with adiabatic condensers or um, evaporative condensers. Adiabatic condensers just having the benefit of using or needing less water to do the work. Um, so basically what an adiabatic condenser does for you, it reduces your dry bulb ambient temperatures down to a wet bulb temperature. Uh, your wet bulb temperature always being lower than your ambient conditions. So basically you are manipulating the ambient conditions to be at a lower um, at the lower ambient, at the lower condition temperature, and that obviously then reduces your your um, operation of your system and leads to energy efficiency. Um, within the Philippines, the relative humidity is quite high. Um, on average, you're looking at about a relative humidity of 72 to 83 percent. Um, so, the Philippines basically consists of a natural adiabatic effect, um, and that's why we do see a very constant temperature through the through the Philippines regions. Um, in this, this does, however, lead to adiabatic condensers not having such a massive impact as it will have in dry ambient conditions, um, which is the most suitable applications for adiabatic and the most benefits can be obtained. But you can still have your ambient conditions basically reduced by up to six degrees Celsius by utilizing ambient conditions. So if there's water available, um, freely uh, or reclaimed to be utilized within these adiabatic condensers, you can have an additional 10 to 15% energy saving by utilizing adiabatic condensers. Then as we are, um, as we are obviously talking, comparing these technologies um, to ambient conditions, I just had a bit of a look at what can be seen within the Philippine regions. Um, so basically, I've included a graph showing the high ambient temperatures uh, over each month for a year period, then the minimum average temperatures, and then the daily average temperatures that can be seen in Manila. Um, so from this, as I've mentioned before, you can see that the Philippines do have a quite a constant ambient temperature, um, which from a design point of view, which which will help me as well, makes it really suitable to design systems for the Philippines, as you do not have a very wide range in operating conditions. Um, <clears throat> but the main outcome of what I what I can see when looking at um, ambient conditions that you will find in, in the Philippine regions is that, from looking at the technologies before, is that CO2 transcritical booster system um, fitted with parallel compression would be a very suitable solution for the Philippine market as the average temperatures is well below 30 degrees Celsius year on. And even your worst case high ambient conditions that you can see is up to 34, still below 35 degrees Celsius, where your parallel compression systems still make you more energy efficient up to 37 degrees Celsius ambient. Um, so that is basically just from my Input to my point of view, probably a little bit of a guideline to say that that is where you would want to see your technology or what type of technology you would like to introduce into the Philippine market. Um, obviously, as more experience is gained, um, 
they can be looking at additional technologies like the ejector systems to further increase um, energy efficiency and making it just more suitable and adaptable for the Philippine market. And with that, we, yes, we basically, I am joined today by Ricardo Baptista from Cubicle International based in South Africa. Um, they have been kind enough to allow me to to utilize their training facility um, so that we can just have a little bit of a, a I would want to say a hands-on experience, but I think in this stage, a, a live web sneak peek into a training facility. <laughs> Um, I hope everybody can can see well. Perhaps you can make the the camera on your browser um, a little bit larger, um, as we won't be showing presentation currently, but we will be focusing on on Ricardo's camera. Um, so the one thing with the facility here is it is a it's it's the the nice thing about this training facility is it is set up to. Um, to mimic and look uh, a lot like what you would find in a refrigeration application within a real store. Um, and that's quite one thing I think is important when looking at a training facility is that once people have their hands and technicians can get their hands on and to start working on these facilities is that they know that once they go into the field, they find similar, they find similar components and ex or even exact same components and have much more experience and feel much free, much more free and willing to, to work on these systems. Um, so I do, do recommend and I do think that it's good to have a little, not a lab type um, setup, but more uh, uh, what you would find in real life. So the training facility that we do have here is a parallel system, um, basically CO2 transcritical booster system fitted with parallel compression. Um, so this facility, as you can see, is spread out and made to be worked on and um, have hands on it. So it's also been taken apart and put together a few times and have had a, quite a few hands on top of it. Um, so just a few things on the far left. Um, I don't know if it's clear enough, but you do see your high pressure valve that I've mentioned before that is regulating your discharge pressure into your receiver pressure. Um, then one thing with CO2 as well is because of the high pressures and utilizing XHP or CO or, or um, a copper alloy, um, copper iron alloy, you really have a sturdy system. So most of the CO2 systems is solid mount, um, and that also needs to have then obviously a proper frame to allow you to. Um, to absorb the vibrations and to work through the system through as a solid mount system. Um, within a CO2 system, and especially this being a training facility, there is a lot of access points. Um, most of the access points is suited, suited and equipped with a small little ball valve. Um, the reason for that is just makes ease for the technicians to tap into or connect to the CO2 system. Uh, so you can have your go, um, gauges and hoses connected to the to the system, and then only after that um, open the pressure valve um, to release the CO2 pressure or to open yourself into the system. Um, this just gives a little bit more um, uh, peace of mind in connecting into a system that you don't need to tap into a high pressure system. Um, so basically, I think Ricardo, if you can maybe show us the the um, gauges. So looking at the gauges, we have a nice cool ambient condition today. So we're running in a transcritical manner of about 63, 64, uh, subcritical manner, excuse me, of about 63 um, bar. So nice subcritical operation today. And then the, obviously your, your MT and LT at its respective suctions um, to maintain the cooling uh, the cooling and your receiver pressure sitting about 38 bar. So the high pressure valve, the effect it has is reducing the pressure from your discharge from 65 bar down to 38 bar. Um, okay, Ricardo will move around for us just to show that each rack also is equipped with a electronic board. So that's the control panel. Within the control panel, you will find your controllers controlling the high pressure valves at operation of your system 
all lead compressors are fitted with variable speed drives um, so that does give you the, the efficiency control and the capacity control. Um, then looking at the oil separators, there basically we can see the parallel compressors. And then looking at the oil separator side of life, on the far left, the VFDs can be displayed. Um, oil separators, all everything is probably, um, as Ken mentioned, everything is fitted with high pressure special um, uh, equipment designed, manufactured, and supplied for CO2 purposes. Um, mostly on your discharge size, having a pressure of up to 130 bar. Um, so I think one thing that you can see here and one thing we can showcase is um, because especially when working on the oil separator, um, the oil separator's function is to have the discharge pressure and high pressure run through it to separate the oil and bring it back to the compressors. Um, so this point of entry basically is your highest pressure point of entry. Uh, so good practice is to have your oil separator bypassed um, and then also to again have an access point for to allow your technician access into the facility. So basically common practice with servicing and changing your oil separator filter would be to bypass your oil separator, um, oil separator. Uh, your system can continue to run so there is no downtime and there is no worries about standstill pressures or having your, your system not cooling at the moment while you have to change that and that allows the technicians and yourselves to have the time to relieve the pressure out of the oil separator in a controlled manner through, the, through access points and ball valves um, allowed for. And then once the pressure has been reduced, allows you access into the receiver to uh, into the oil separator to change and remove the oil oil filters. Um, that also gives you peace of mind. Like I said, having an operational system that good refrigeration practice can be obtained, having where a quick vacuum can be pulled before the system is purged again with CO2 um, and open up to the rest of the, the facility. When purging a CO2 system with CO2, while I'm on that topic, it's when starting up a system, it's always good to remember um, that CO2 has a very high triple point um, of about 5.8 bar. So good practice is to have vapor introduced into your system up until a minimum of 10 bar uh, before liquid is introduced into the system. Um, the common reason for that is if liquid is introduced into a system below five bar, dry ice will form. Um, and that can take you quite some time to then try and get rid of the, the dry ice within the system. Um, so then Ricardo has also just showed us some of the equipment that we can see or utilize within the within the installation, um, on the installation side as well, and not just on the racks. So basically, within a CO2 system as well, um, electronic expansion the valves are utilized at the evaporators or the cabinets. Um, this gives you, firstly, good control. It leads to energy efficiency. So within your installation side of life, um, each evaporator and each cooling point will be equipped with an electronic expansion valve and a pressure transducer to control your cooling at your um, evaporators. Um, high pressure ball valves all, um, are utilized and ball valves equipped with the sufficient energy, um, sufficient pressure rating to adhere to your design pressure. So, um, I mean, today these valves are freely available um, and also um, fitted with copper alloy fittings. So, even a copper alloy fitting ball valve that can be braced or, or um, silver soldered has a pressure rating of up to 130 bar. Um, stainless steel ball valves are available if that is a preference and that is a recommend um, or a requirement. Um, and then also basically you can see like that is your, your copper alloy um, piping that can be utilized. Um, one way of, of also distinguishing between having the right um, piping utilized is if you do have a magnet freely available, a copper alloy will attract the magnet and the magnet will be stuck to that and not to a normal standard. Um, copper piping. Um, so also basically your pressure relief valves, which is one of the safety, the important safety aspects within a system, 
is to have these relief valves according to your design pressure. Um, so either from your media, your low temp suction would be equipped with 30, 35 bar pressure relief valves, medium temp suction 45 up to 50 or 60 bar, and your discharge common practice is to have it up to 130 bar pressure relief valves uh, to protect the system and to just from a safety point of view. Um, it's also good practice not to ensure that within your system you don't isolate any CO2, um, especially CO2 liquid, um, as this will basically, when it heats up, will go to its corresponding pressure and might exceed your your installation um, design pressure. Um, and if it's not exposed to a safety relief out and trapped or isolated, can can cause um, your system to perhaps burst. Um, so I think that was hopefully a good introduction and hopefully some, hopefully everybody could see that a bit. So thank you, Ricardo, for your side. I appreciate the help. Um, and I'm sure that there might be probably some Q and A's from, from Devon or anybody else. This was fantastic. I was actually about to encourage you to keep going. Uh, if, there, if there is anything else you'd like to show uh, from the facility, any, any part of the system, because I think this is extremely valuable for the, for the industry, knowing that we don't have any CO2 transcritical system up and running in, in, in Philippines as of now. So I think this is, this is a lot of uh, useful information. Now, maybe we can start with a question. What would you advise uh, to local manufacturers, local contractors that are interested in building the system themselves? Or, or you know, putting together had a hands-on experience. Where is the best time, best place to start when it comes to designing and manufacturing the CO2 system? Well, I think the, the best place. Sorry, I'm just getting some feedback on a mic. Um, the best place, probably, like you say, is to, I think to get some hands-on experience. Um, there is a lot of facilities internationally um, around the globe available for hands-on and training of contractors and, and OEMs. Um, that's always a good place to, to get started and start learning into it. Um, there's a lot of online training facilities as well. Um, but I think probably the, it's always difficult, and especially today's time, um, to travel abroad and to, to move around to, to go and see these facilities. So. It would be great. It is great, and it is advised to have a facility, and that's why I did mention in the beginning as well to have a facility that mimics and looks close as possible to what you would find in a supermarket or industrial application, where people are freely available to come around and get their hands on it. Um, secondly, I think the thing always that everybody asks me, like, where is the best to get your experience? Like, it sometimes is a catch uh, twenty-two, and it's a a bit of an egg and uh, a chicken and egg situation, but the best way to get experience is to get your hands on your first actual project. Um, I think that everybody, there's no more motivation than having an actual project to go. So I think probably to get this in, kicked off in a country, and I think what we had probably in South Africa, which we were fortunate enough to have about 10 years ago, is to have, a, um, have an end user support and have the trust in you to to take that step and move forward all right thank you just a follow-up question and we have a two questions from the delegates in terms of where is the best place to start when we talk about the first co 2 transcritical system uh, in a country is it easier to work with a small condensing unit or would you jump right away into the large industrial project uh, does it make a big difference what's the learning curve for co 2 transcritical like um, good question. <laughs> I can talk out of just my ex my own experience, like jumping into it was in retail applications. Um, that was where CO2 predominantly saw its its um, biggest intro. Um, I think today, for instance, we saw R290 um, being presented, which is a, I do agree, I think is a very good um, technology for supermarkets and especially smaller convenient type stores. So I would probably say from a practical point of view, I would look at your larger or maybe even small and light industrial applications. Um, you, within light industrial applications, the reason I say that is because you do have a little bit of a longer lead time and time frame usually um, depicted with these systems, um, which can get you 
um, exposure and access to to the support that you need from from um, your suppliers or OEMs or or third party um, support to help you get through the process. Um, so I would say, like basically, you could start anywhere. But I would say, for a continuity point of view, I would I would start with a larger type of systems. Um, from a large retail or a, a light industrial type of system uh, to get you really the full experience of CO2. Uh, and Because I think it, it would be, it's easier to work on a condensing unit after you had experience with a larger type system than it is to have a, is, than it is to jump from a condensing unit to a larger type system. Thank you, thank you. And then actually there are first discussions on the ground in the Philippines about the CO2 transcritical project uh, that would hopefully be coming online next year. So we'll stay tuned uh, and keep on uh, informing the industry about the progress. We have a question from the audience and it's about what type of oil is used in the system and what software is used to estimate the energy benefits. Uh, can you please elaborate or maybe ask uh, Ricardo to jump in? Uh, so from an oil point of view, polyol ester oil is used um, within most of these systems. Um, PAG oil can be used as well. So there's, there's benefits and negatives to both of them. Um, the benefit of the POE oil is it's highly miscible with CO2. So you get a good carry back with, with, um, of oil within your system. So CO2 carries POE oil very well. Um, within a ejector system, for instance, or flooded type systems, you would like to perhaps use PAG um, oil as it's not as miserable with CO2, so it's easily extractable out of a receiver. Um, because utilizing an ejector system, for instance, you don't have your suction coming back to your medium term compressor the whole time and oil needs to be extracted out of the system. So then PAG would be recommended. Uh, but I would say probably about 80% plus 90% of the system seen in the in the field will make is making use of polyolester oil. Um, then, sorry, I forgot the second part. <laughs> it is being used to, to evaluate the, the performance and the energy. Uh, okay, so yeah, they, I mean, the performance of the LRG, like, firstly, you have, um, it's your, your standard, um, you can have your energy, your power consumption measured, but there is a lot of, um, I think even some of the controllers, even some of the controller suppliers have COP measurement tools um, and stuff that can be added onto the system. So. Um, mostly it is power consumption and it will go back to a linear, if you need to compare it with additional or alter or other types of systems, it will go back to linear meterage of cooling um, to, to um, compare it on an apples to apples basis. Excellent. Uh, next question. We have them coming now, so we'll keep going for another two or three minutes. When the unit is not operating, how do you manage the high pressure of CO2? So, okay, there's two, so there's a few things there that you can look at. Firstly, your design pressure can be considered. If you do design your um, system to be um, overall have an 80 bar or up to a 90 bar um, pressure rating, you, will, you are able to control the pressures without any additional uh, measures being added into the system. So that is one aspect is you can have a system to designed for um, up to those pressures. Uh, all the equipment is available today. Your expansion devices, even the low-term compressors today are available to adhere to these pressures. Um, second of all, you would have a UPS system within your um, system. So even if, so if your standstill or your system is not running because of a power failure or something like that, you will have your high pressure valve and your flash gas valve and you control, control these valves and isolate pressures in the, where it is required. Um, and second of all, you can basically have either an auxiliary system running to cool the receiver down and, and maintain your um, your pressures within your receiver. Um, a common system, even a standard system that is not rated at a high pressure and does not is not equipped with an auxiliary system, does have a good five, six, seven, up sometimes up to eight hours, depending on the insulation. Um, that it can stand still before it would actually lose a charge. So, so today there is a lot of ways. I know even in New Zealand, for instance, the pressure is rated for up to 80 bar overall because of all the earthquakes going on and stuff like that. They do have sometimes a lot of power outages for up to weeks. Um, and these systems can maintain the pressure and withhold the CO2 in them. 
Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a pleasure to be working with true experts when it comes to CO2 and you have such a rich experience. Can, can you just, in, in the end, uh, final question, can you tell us what motivates you to work with these solutions? What drives you? Because you have been working with CO2 for, what, 15 years by now? Yeah, it's been about 15 years. Um, what drives me is like, firstly, I think it's, and I think it's not just me, it's one thing I do experience and that's uh, with everybody that gets their hands on it is it's, 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 a, it's a very nice challenge and it's very, I think naturals being introduced into the industry is not just from a sustainable point of view, the right thing to do and the only thing that we have to do, but even looking at the, at the team before me having the presentation about R290, you can see the excitement being brought back into refrigeration. Um, with people having to look at new challenges and uh, it's it's fun. <laughs> so I guess my motivation is to support the industry. What gets me up is to is to see naturals and help naturals get into the industry. Um, I, I keep on, everybody always says like, um, but there's a lot of people doing it. But the sad thing today is 95% of what is out there currently installed is not running on natural refrigerants, especially in the retail industry. And we don't have a lot of time and we need to, to move to, to convert these systems to, to naturals, to not only adhere to energy saving, to reduce the demand on, on grid power, but also to, to work towards us hitting our Kigali amendment and hitting the Montreal Protocol guidelines to, to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. Uh, very well put. Uh, I think that what, what we have witnessed last 10 years in, in the refrigeration industry when it comes to sustainable solutions, clean cooling, is so much innovation that's perhaps more than last 50 uh, in industrial and commercial, like commercial. So it's exciting uh, to be part of this industry. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you and Ricardo uh, for joining us for this very, very interesting uh, presentation and the technical training workshop. We will be back with more, uh, I'm sure. But um, uh, on, on behalf of uh, the team and all delegates, thank you very, very much for joining. All right, well, thank you, uh, Wynand, again. And with that, uh, you can see, uh, you can contact Wynand. We will share the recording and the presentation afterwards as well. With that, uh, we move to the uh, last part of our technical training workshop. I will be presenting uh, about uh, all uh, the other solutions that we have identified in the commercial food retail uh, based on uh, sustainable uh, technologies. Uh, we already had a very extensive uh, case study about R290 Waterloo. We heard a lot about CO2 transcritical being deployed in high ambient temperature. And now uh, we will have a short overview, about 10, 15 minutes, about uh, basically highlighting the end uses around the world. And by now, there is hundreds of, of end users working with R290, with CO2, with ammonia, with different con configuration. So we have prepared uh, for you a mix of uh, a selection, selection of, of uh, these examples of end users working with uh, natural refrigerants in uh, food retail. First off, uh, first example, uh, we will start with the R290. We already heard about the water loop configuration. So uh, this is an example of uh, quite a few actually um, German uh, retailers such as Lidl or Aldi and others are working with uh, R290 plugin uh, systems since many years back. There's hundreds, hundreds of thousands of uh, plugin uh, units being installed based on uh, R290 since uh, more than 10 years ago. So uh, name, namely a little uh, more than 1500 stores in France equipped with, with R290 already. So you see the plugin R290 solutions are quite popular in pretty much everywhere in, in the world. Next example, uh, another use of propane in uh, commercial refrigeration comes from Belgium. A cold youth uh, group is using uh, propane chillers uh, with uh, glycol in the second as a secondary coolant that is then circulated in the showcases to cool or their uh, most or all I believe of their supermarkets in in Belgium. They also use uh, plug-in hydrocarbon systems, and lately they have also installed a hydrocarbon heat pump on their roof to provide air conditioning. So you see that there is a lot of innovation in this space. This is a fairly unique uh, solution that is also applicable in high ambient temperatures. So perhaps we will see more of this configuration in uh, Southeast Asia as well. Next up, we will talk about uh, different transcritical uh, systems. 
This is an example from Japan. Lawson has been one of the pioneers of CO2 transcritical uh, condensing unit uh, systems being installed since 2010. They usually use 10 and 2 horsepower uh, units combined for the medium and uh, low uh, temperatures. As of two years ago, they have started to work with multiple suppliers on providing solution to their stores. As of February 2020, uh, Lawson uh, claims to have more than 4,000 CO2 transcritical uh, stores, condensing units. So they are uh, the leader in, in the world when it comes to the number of stores using CO2 with a lot of experience and with expansion beyond Japan when it comes to their CO2 deployment. Uh, last year, uh, they have uh, installed Actually, this year, my apologies, they have installed the first full, uh, full uh, natural refrigerant store. To explain, uh, they combine their showcases uh, powered by CO2 condensing unit with uh, uh, hydrocarbons that are being used in the kitchen, uh, the back end of the store, when the foods are being uh, prepared, uh, the different dishes are being prepared. So there's a commercial refrigerators, ice makers. And in this pilot store, they have installed all the systems uh, combining using uh, hydrocarbons, R290 and R600A. So this is 100% uh, refrigeration with natural refrigerants, first of its kind in uh, Japan. That brings us also to food service, the, the sector that is somehow uh, untouched yet when it comes to uh, clean cooling solutions, but we believe that that trend will start next year. Transcritical uh, rack systems. Uh, Japan uh, popularized the condensing units uh, being deployed in small format stores as well as large supermarkets. In Europe, the CO2 systems have developed around the larger capacity uh, rack systems. So this is an example uh, from US. Not only Europe, of course, has been uh, using the CO2 racks. Aldi in the US have more than 100 uh, CO2 stores as of 2018, while Aldi in uh, Germany is having 1,500 stores using the, the rack systems. So this is this is a uh, most common and most uh, used uh, CO2 uh, system in Europe is the large capacity rack by uh, by many uh, suppliers these days. Example from Switzerland uh, again a CO2 transcritical rack, but as as we progressed with the development of the technology, the CO2 transcritical rack has been also used for air conditioning for providing of hot water uh, with the heat reclaim for melting of ice uh, in a heat pump configuration. Uh, there's many different advancements added to the system. So there's, there was a lot of um, innovation in this space. Migros plans to use, all, uh, use CO2 in all of their stores by 2025. Transcritic rec combined with the heat pump. Uh, this time, this is a little net zero store uh, concept that has a ground source heat pump, which provides uh, the, uh, the the condensing of the, the CO2 transcritical uh, throughout the year, hence in improving the energy efficiency. So this store will open in, it was opened in uh, 2019 in September. Some more technical details, as I mentioned, we'll be sharing the slides uh, afterwards with all delegates so you can access this technical information. It's important to mention that the CO2 system is used also as a chiller for air conditioning. So we see that one system can cover all the thermal needs of a retail facility. To sum it up, CO2 transcritical, uh, including the large capacity installation in industrial refrigeration, there are more than 35,000 uh, projects, facilities equipped with uh, CO2 transcritical by uh, 2019 and 2019. So there is uh, a fast growing market uh, around the world for CO2 transcritical. Maybe something that is quite unique in our industry, and we had a question asking about the combination of CO2 and propane. So there is an example of Whole Foods in the US in California have installed in 2016 its first store that uh, combines CO2 and hydrocarbons. Uh, hydrocarbons on the high side in the cascade configuration to uh, basically condense, cool the, the CO2 that is then uh, being uh, circulating in the, the uh, show, showcases in the store. So we did had, uh, Whole Foods was uh, presenting at, at our events in the past several times. And I do remember specifically uh, Whole Foods mentioning it was very 
very uh, challenging to install the technology. However, the performance and the energy efficiency was super in the high ambient uh, temperature uh, environment. So there is different configurations available. Finally, uh, some more details uh, about the chiller itself using 25 and 39 pounds of RT90 in each chiller. CO2 charge uh, moving on to uh, one of our final slides, which is also rarely used, but uh, in our estimate, there is about 10 uh, stores using ammonia CO2 cascades. Also, ammonia used you know, on the high side of the refrigeration systems to uh, cool CO2, and uh, the efficiency results in high ambient temperatures are, are uh, very impressive. Of course, the complexity and perhaps the cost of the systems are, are higher than standard transcritical systems. Uh, so the business case is something that has to be investigated by each retailer. The system is used for air conditioning and it's combined with the heat reclaim uh, and other. So the, how much of ammonia? 61 kilos of ammonia, which is located in the machine room only. Of course, so it comes with certain uh, complexity when it comes to installation, maintenance, servicing, and so on. But these are examples from around the world when it comes to different configuration. So as I mentioned, there's hundreds of thousands of plug-in R290 systems. There are uh, several thousand of R290 water loop systems. There are several CO2 water loop systems as well. There are different configuration of CO2 transcritical system from small condensing units to large refrigeration systems. And uh, in the publication that uh, will be, will be uh, coming up uh, later this month, we focus on the best practices when it comes to food retail, highlighting uh, the details behind these technologies. So we will uh, again be able to share with you the link once the, the, the report, the, the magazine is published so you can access uh, to, to this more detailed information about uh, the choice behind the refrigeration and the experience with different configuration. We now uh, can move to Q&A. We have about 10 minutes left. So I will look into the questions or Devin, there's a, there's a general question. We had a question for uh, a general question. Is it possible to have R290 CO2 cascade system or R290 CO2 with CO2 pump circulation? So as I mentioned, uh, there is an example of R290 CO2 cascade uh, its installation in California by Whole Foods from 2016. I do not know about R290 and CO2, CO2 being pumped. However, there is a, the glycol solution. Uh, in, uh, there was a number of installations that were done by the Colerud uh, group in, in Belgium. All right, so at this point, we do not have any incoming questions. So Devin, you can join me if you have any questions. I can join your camera. All right. Well, we have we have still a few minutes to go, but uh, I believe we had a very comprehensive uh, comprehensive program for the last three hours uh, with very interesting con uh, content. What uh, we can do now, we can uh, invite everyone to join the the post uh, technical training workshop Zoom call, very informal Zoom call, and uh, we can carry on with the discussion there. From our end, uh, we thank you uh, to all our uh, guest speakers and presenters from uh, DNR, from UNIDO, from RACTAP, from Cold Front, as well as uh, from uh, South Africa, Wynand and Ricardo. It was uh, one, it was the first of our technical training workshops organized by the Coaching Innovation Hub. We have uh, several other events planned. Uh, we will be, of course, informing the network about the upcoming events, focusing on not only commercial refrigeration, but also on transport, on industry refrigeration, on business case, new business case uh, that is uh, applied, being applied to uh, our industry, the cold chain, in different parts of the world. We'll be also addressing the topics of standards, training, regulation, and policy. Our uh, next event will be actually Atmosphere Asia, uh, organized by Sheko on 17th and 18th uh, November. It will be online event. 
and we will be uh, addressing a lot of the topics relevant to the food cold chain and cold chain innovation hub will be uh, one of the active participants including uh, the guests from uh, international uh, markets as well as the local industry so we will be sharing the information from uh, this first technical training workshop as well as the upcoming events. We'll be uploading the content and the recordings from the whole event. And we will be in touch with you uh, shortly uh, with more information. So with that, uh, I would like to uh, close the meeting. We have, uh, we have a few more minutes, but I will close the meeting now and we will open the Zoom. Uh, you have the link in the resources. So on your console, on the, in the resource uh, field, you can access the Zoom meeting and we'll be uh, online in Zoom in about two minutes. So uh, looking forward to, uh, to having informal chat with the delegates that will join us after the session. So thank you very much again for tuning in and uh, we'll be in touch soon.